Thank you, Brother Randall and Brother Keith, Brother Dillon, for taking care of our services this morning. Again, y'all uh, keep Brother Kenny in mind and pray for him, but I stand in need of your prayers this morning. Now, I'm a little, uh, my body's a little bit tired, many of you know, but to give you a little background, uh, uh, three days ago I was in Rome, Italy. I caught a plane uh, Thursday morning, and of course Rome is seven hours ahead of us. Uh, just take a little personal privilege here a little minute because it, it gets down a minute to a subject on my mind. But uh, in Rome, it's which is seven hours ahead. Uh, my wife and I had to get up at five in the morning Thursday uh, to go to settle at the airport in Rome and take a plane home back to Dallas, Fort Worth. It's an 11 and a half hour flight. And so when you take it, when you get up at five o'clock, that's 10 p.m. level time. So, you know, we've been over there for the uh, wedding of my son. Many of you know, my son got married and uh, for whatever reason, you know, I, I've told my son, you don't question what the brides and their mothers choose to do, but they chose to get married in Italy. Uh, as I told my son, your uh, weddings were planned by usually the, your wife and her mother, and you stay out of it other than to pay the bills and get dressed and show up on time. That's kind of all the man's role is in a wedding, jokingly, of course. Uh, but we had a good wedding, a nice wedding. And, but coming home, we left uh, Rome at we got up to leave. Our plane wasn't a little later, but you have to be there and you have to go through customs and show your passport. You had to have a COVID test within the last 48 hours. And so we had to get there and prove all of that and show our passports and show my vaccination and all these things to get clearance at the airport so we could even come home. So we got up at 5 in the morning. Well, that's 10 p.m. Texas time. So we did that, got to the airport and got through all that okay. Uh, flew home uh, between 11 and a half and 12 hours, landed at Dallas about 3 o'clock in the afternoon, uh, been up all day. You, you, know, you think you'll try to get some sleep on the plane, and it's daylight, daytime, and I've already gotten accustomed to the wrong time, so um, it's daytime already, and we got in our car and decided, well, let's just drive home. It's 3 in the afternoon. You know, we can drive home, so we ended up driving home and got home about 10 o'clock that night and had to make several stops more than normal, but by the time we got home at 10 o'clock at night, We'd effectively been awake 24 hours straight. So we got home, and, and it's a little hard to catch up. You think you'll sleep the first night for 10 or 12 hours, and you don't do that. You, I still woke up at 5 in the morning. and <coughs> So it's taken a little bit of my body to adjust, and, but I had a good trip and had an enjoyable time. And, uh, so, but my body's a little bit tired, but my mind is on a subject this morning I want to talk to you about. But real briefly, again, again, to give you a little background, even to what I want to talk to you about this morning, uh, my son got married, and he and his uh, wife, she's a, a doctor, medical doctor in New Jersey, and they're going to live in New Jersey. They're still over there in Italy, and we're getting texts back and forth with them. We went over early. I have some meetings that I have to go to the next few days, so I had to come back. So my wife and I, we left early, 10 days before the wedding, 10 days total, and uh, went and stayed three days in Rome, and uh, three days in Florence, and a couple of days in a smaller town called Siena, Beautiful town, lots of things going on. And then we went to the wedding venue, which is about two hours north of Rome, out in the country, at a farmhouse. They, it's been, they, they host a lot of weddings, but it's a vineyard. It's a vineyard. Uh, they uh, grow their own wine, grapes and wine. Uh, they uh, grow their own olive trees and make olive oil. And as part of one of the gifts they gave us, a little olive oil that was there on the, uh, made on the farm there. And they also grow figs. And I didn't know much about figs, but he went and pulled one off the tree for me when I was visiting him in breakfast one morning. Pulled one off the tree and walked over and said, you know, wiped it off good and said, now take a bite out of that, you know, and I'm going, it's green. I took a bite of it, real soft, real sweet. It's wonderful, right off the tree, fresh. It's really wonderful, but uh, beautiful place. And it, in the rural area of Italy, this is in the Tuscany area. It's a beautiful area, a lot of vineyards, a lot of wineries, uh, real rolling plains, a lot of hills. And it's just a beautiful countryside, and it made a beautiful backdrop. I've shown several of you the picture I have of uh, uh, my son Reed and his wife now, Elisa, and, and uh, us standing there with the backdrop of the Italy countryside in the background. And I have to admit, it did uh, uh, make a beautiful wedding site and a wedding location. While in Rome, we went to, the, of course, the Colosseum, and I, I wanted to see the Arch of Titus. Uh, they, they've got a lot of monuments in Rome. It's, it's loaded with monuments, a lot of idols that they worship. But the Arch of Titus is huge. It's a huge archway. They've got the Arch of Constantine, Arch of Titus, 
a lot of things to Caesar and Nero and a lot of the emperors they had back then. Titus was the uh, son of Vespasian, who was the emperor of Rome. <coughs> uh, Nero was the last. He was in power when the apostle Paul was captured was, and put in under arrest and eventually killed and beheaded, as along with the apostle Peter a few months later. They were both beheaded by Nero. And Nero was the last of the Caesar family. You know, had Julius Caesar and all the Caesar family after that. He was the last one that was related to the Caesar family, so they had to choose a new leader. They chose Vespasian. Vespasian had two sons, uh, Titus and Dominican. And Titus was the one that was the leader of the army that was sent to Jerusalem in 68 A.D. to try to put down the, the riot that was going on there, the uprising, the challengings by the Jewish people of the Roman leadership. And the Jews started kind of rebelling against them. Of course, we know that the fall of, Rome, fall of Jerusalem in 70 A.D. is what ended, we believe, spiritually, the, Jew, the Jewish as the chosen people. All us Gentiles were incorporated into that. That began when Christ was born. It ended in 70 A.D. That's the time phase in which and then the, the Jewish were out of power for a long time as a physical nation until 1948 when they moved back in. But the nation of Israel is a physical nation of Jewish people. It's no longer the chosen people. All of us have been incorporated. All of God's elect are incorporated into that now. But Titus, because he went over there, sent over there, and he finally got tired of dealing with the Jewish people, so he just literally uh, destroyed them and, and killed a lot of them. You can read a lot of this in Hassel's history. Brother Dwayne and I talk occasionally about Hassel history and the background, but it's got some good background about Elder Hassel and his father and son uh, put out the church history to the Primitive Baptist, went all the way back to that time. Titus destroyed Jerusalem in 70 AD and, and killed and burnt down the city, destroyed the temple, took a lot of the goods out of the temple, uh, came back home, and they captured over like three and a half million Jews and sent them into slavery in lots of places. People, a lot of them escaped. But Titus himself brought back, this is the Roman government reports, we knew he brought back some, but they reported he brought back 15,000 Jewish people they converted into slaves to the Roman government, and they were used to build the Colosseum. We've got two of the Colosseum, you know, and I've always thought, well, it's a nice small little arena. No, it's not. It'll seat about 80,000 people. It would in its heyday. It's huge and big, and you get to see it, and how they had trap doors underneath it, which they put the, the gladiators in, and the lions, and tigers, and, and the bears, the wild animals in. <clears throat> but these Jewish people that were brought back, they built the temple, I mean, excuse me, built the Colosseum, uh, from 70 A.D. to 80, about 80, 82 A.D., they built this huge Colosseum in a 10-year period. Uh, Titus came back and was a big hero because he had conquered the Jewish nation. You know, Roman w had great military strength. The Jewish people were not really military-oriented at that time. But he conquered them and brought a lot of them back, and so they made him a hero in Rome. You get to see this huge archway to Titus. Now, I'll have a little bit of this in the Banner of Love this month. i got a picture of uh, this huge archway of Titus. He's a hero now, to, was a hero to the Roman people because he came back and uh, slaughtered the Jews, uh, destroyed Jerusalem, and then brought back these slaves to build it. So I you know, get to see that. I appreciate the political value of that and saw that. And while there also, I went to the, uh, the Palatine Hill where all the, uh, the uh, Roman leadership was, all the Caesars were there, and Nero, and where they built their castles, and a lot of it's been destroyed. And they don't, just, they don't burn something down. They just cover it up with dirt and build something on top of it. And there's about four layers there, the levels. The hill's gotten larger because they just cover stuff up and build another palace on top of it. But also one thing there that was a particular interest, interest to me, about 25, 30 years ago, I heard Elder Sonny Piles preach a sermon. He talked about Apostle Paul, how he wrote the book of Timothy, and he wrote four books of the Bible, Philippians, Colossians, Second uh, Timothy, and I, I forgot that there's one more there I'll think of in a minute. He wrote four books of the Bible while he was imprisoned. Three of those he was under house arrest, and the fourth one, Second Timothy, he wrote while he was in a dungeon prison in Rome. And uh, Elder Piles preached on that, and, and that just caught my interest. And so uh, I, I went looking for this prison, and it's still there. It's called the Mamertine Prison. I found it, and uh, that Paul was in prison there for all one year, 19, I mean, 1968, the year of 68, and then Peter right after him. Apostle Paul, of course, was beheaded by Nero, and uh, Peter was crucified upside down on a cross by Nero. 
It's called the Mamertine Prison, and I found it. It's not too far from the Coliseum. And I got to go in, and we were the only ones there. It's a museum now. We were the only ones there. Had to pay 10 bucks to get in. But anyway, got inside it, and, and it's a ground. It's the first floor is run underground, and then it's got a dungeon level to it that you access by a manhole cover, and they would lower prisoners down into that. And this was only the prisoners they were going to kill, capital prisoners, uh, uh, doing away with political prisoners primarily. So Paul was there, and uh, Peter was there, and they had a list of the other. They kept good records. They had a list of all the other prisoners there that were eventually killed and beheaded or, or killed in some way uh, by the Roman government. But now they have cut a place in the side, and I said take a little stairway and go actually down inside that bottom dungeon prison where the Apostle Paul and Peter were. And it's truly a dungeon. It was part of the sewer system that Nero built when he burned Rome in 64 A.D., he rebuilt a lot of it and built in a sewer system. It was a modern city at that time, built a sewer system. Well, they didn't build a prison. They put people under house arrest, but they had political prisoners. Now they wanted to imprison until they could kill them some way, execute them. And so they boxed off part of the sewer system, blocked it off, and so they made a prison out of it, and you got through it through a manhole cupboard. It's about 14, 18 inches circle, and it's still there. And you ever go down and look in and he was the Lord's food down. Uh, Luke was there with him. If you'll read Second Timothy, Luke, the uh, Lord's stuff down to him. And then Paul handed his writings back up. And you talk about somebody who uh, it really, that was the most important place that I felt like I visited. Because Apostle Paul, while he was imprisoned, either under arrest or in that dungeon, he wrote four books of the Bible and some of the best writing, including Philippians, which he said, Whatever state you find yourself in, they're in to be content. And I'm going, I'm sitting here thinking about it. I'm looking, there's no way I could be content in that. Great lesson in that. See, down there, you know, just think, remember, this is a sewer system for, for stormwater. It's got all the, the rats and the mice and the cockroaches and the snakes. No telling what all was in there that he had to live with during that period. And then Apostle Peter after him, too. And they've got the records on the wall of all the people. And right there is, you know, it's in Latin, so it's Paulus. And El Pietro, but it's Paul and Peter clearly, them in prison there. So that was that was uh, important to me, and I got to see that. We went to Rome and spent a few days there, and a lot of artwork there by Leonardo da Vinci, a lot of artwork by uh, Raphael and Michelangelo. And of course, they didn't appreciate my humor. I said, "Well, it's Michelangelo and and uh, da Vin you know uh, Leonardo da Vinci and Raphael. Where's Donatello, the fourth Ninja Turtle?" They didn't appreciate my humor. So uh, anyway, uh, um, we got to see a lot of that, and then we went out into the rural areas, which I really enjoyed. And I would go back to Rome, to Italy, for the rural areas. Uh, we stayed in the city of Siena for a couple of days, and that's a city that's built up on a hill, and it's walled. It's got a full wall around it, about a mile radius wall, about 15 to 18 feet tall. They did it for protection. They built their small cities that could do it up on a hill, and then they walled the city so that there was protection from enemies. Every city was its own country in those days. And then Rome went out and captured all of them. And made the, that's how they got to be Italy. Roman government went out and captured all of them. But we went out then about uh, 30 minutes from there to the site of the wedding. It's called Tier de Nero, Tier de Nano. And it's in the middle of a country of several cities, and you can see them. They're out there on a hill. The cities are built on a hill, and they all got a wall around them, kind of a fortress around them. And I sat there one morning drinking coffee, and I look, and I said, you know, a city on a hill cannot be hid. Right out of Matthew, the Sermon on the Mount. And he goes on and says, you know, let your light so shine. You don't take a light and, and bury it underneath it. And a city up on a hill cannot be hidden. It's a great lesson in that for us. And I thought about that a long time, about I see what it means now. I, I understand when you see it live there, it's a big help because I said, yeah, you can see every city around here because they're all over there up on a hill. They walled, like Jerusalem was at one time. But this little place where we had the uh, the farm where we had it, they, they grow vineyards. It's got a big vineyard all around it. Every farm around there has vineyards, and they grow their own wine, and they grow their own olives. And I walked out, my wife and I walked out, and I looked at the grapevines and, and, and uh, looking at them there. And you can see how they take them, and they do them. A lot of them like here, except they're much neater. They really take care of them, and they've been doing this a long time. So they got the, the vines that go across the wires between fence posts is what I would call it. 
and then they prune them such that they prune away all the dead material and they let the grapes fall to the bottom and so the grapes are right there hand high easy to harvest and great looking grapes bigger they, they know how to grow grapes and they know how to prune them back and do that and you can see how they've pruned the, the branches of the wine and we're sitting there looking at this and talking about it I said boy they're efficient they know how to do this and you can see how they do it so it's easier to pick the grapes and my wife says well you know day after tomorrow we got to leave and go home and don't you have to speak Sunday at Lubbock and I said yeah I do and she said what are you going to talk about and I said I don't know she said isn't there a place about the vine and the branches in the Bible and I said yeah that's in the 15th chapter of John and she said you're sitting here looking at it I don't know why that didn't and so she suggested that and then you know the one they say you know doggone it I couldn't get that off my mind ever since she told me that and said that so I want to speak to you this morning on the 15th chapter of John about where Jesus talks about I'm the vine and you are the branches this is an important part of the Bible. I don't think I've ever spoken on this, but it's an important part because it's one that is confused and misinterpreted and misunderstood. The largest part of the Christian world believes that this is the, the part, if there's a, any way you can fall from grace, it's taught in the 15th chapter of John, the first half of that. So I want to speak to you that this morning because uh, that's on my mind and it's an important subject and it's important that we all understand it, to, and especially if we can understand what we believe should be the proper interpretation of that there. I want to go to the 15th chapter, and I'm going to read the first 11 verses first, and then we'll let's talk about this a little bit and what we think should be the uh, proper way to look at this. 15th chapter of, of John, now keep in mind, every verse in the 15th chapter of John is in red. Now you, most of you know if you're reading it and it's in red, it's the words of Christ himself. He is speaking the entirety of the 15th chapter of John. In fact, he does most of the 14th chapter, most of the 13th chapter, over back to the middle of chapter 12. Chapter 12, Jesus makes his entry into Jerusalem, his triumphant entry into Jerusalem, cleanses the temple, uh, and talking about that my hour is now come. Uh, that's where the people that are asking him says, we would see Jesus, which we sang this morning. Uh, but there's a lot of good stuff here that I'm passing. The 13th chapter of John, of course, is where they're having the Last Supper, and Jesus washes the apostles' feet. And in 14th chapter of John, he goes over here, and he talks about Jesus has a good conversation with his apostles. They want to know where he's going. He gives them a lot of background. I'm going to leave you, I'm, but I'm not going to I'm gonna go prepare a place for you. But I'm not going to leave you by yourself. Comfortless, I'll send it. A comforter will be coming. He's talking about the Holy Spirit. I'm going to leave you with the Spirit, which we have today and still continue to have. So there's a lot of good stuff here I'm skipping over because I want to get to the 15th chapter of John, especially the first half of that chapter. 15th chapter of John, let me read it. I am the true vine, and my Father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that heareth not, that, excuse me, every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away, and every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth, that it may bring forth fruit more fruit when he says purges he's talking about pruning it uh, verse, uh, verse 3 now you are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you abide in me and I in you as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself except it abide in the vine no more can ye except ye abide in me I am the vine and you are the branches he that abideth in me and I in him that same bringeth forth much fruit for without me you can do nothing. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered, and men gather them up and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. If ye abide in me, and my words abide in you, you shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. Herein is my Father glorified, that ye bear much fruit, so shall ye be my disciples. As the Father has learned, excuse me, as the Father has loved you, so have I loved you. Continue ye in my love. If you keep my commandments, and uh, ye shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things have I spoken unto you, that my joy might remain in you, and that your joy might be full. I'll stop there for the moment, but this is the, the, the place where you'll hear people talk what we call where you can fall from grace. If you don't abide in Christ, then you're like the vine and he'll take it off and purge it and, and cut it loose and it withers and dies and you're cast into the fire 
and burned. Even though you're part of the vine initially, if you don't produce fruit, you'll be cast aside and you'll withered and you'll be burned. Therefore, it's what we call you can fall from grace. You'll lose your eternal salvation because you didn't abide in Christ. This is one of the primary places where under the doctrine in the Bible, their doctrine is you can fall from grace. Uh, and, and, and the words seem pretty strong, but if you don't abide in him, and you're like the, the branch that withers, doesn't produce any fruit, if you're not doing good works, see, that means you're not producing fruit. If you're not doing good works, if you're not following Christ, if you're not following his commandments, then you're going to be like the, the branch that withers and dies and is pulled loose and pulled loose away from uh, the vine, which Christ is the vine, pulled away from it and destroyed and burned up and, and gone. And they say that's when you, you've got to persevere in your good works. If you don't, then you could fall from grace and lose your eternal salvation. So that's what's taught. That's what I want to go through and talk to you about here for just a little bit. But first of all, before we get into this about maybe what we don't know and don't understand, let's talk about the things that we do understand. Let's make sure that we're on a firm foundation on those things that we do understand. Go with me to, well, you don't have to go over there, but 2 Timothy chapter 1. Again, I'm not going to give you any verses that you hadn't already heard because, first of all, I want to reinforce what we believe here. So before we go into this, I think it helps us in our interpretation. 2 Timothy 1 and 9. God who saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began, but is now made manifest by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ, who has abolished death and has brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Now we're reading the gospel here in John. So it says, and, and even uh, Paul here tells us that life and immortality are brought to light through the gospel. The gospel doesn't bring life and immortality. It brings them to light. It tells you about them. So number one, that's, let's start with that. But it also, we were, we were set aside before the world began by the election of God for that purpose. Go with me to Romans chapter 9. Romans chapter 9, verse 11. I'm just going to pick some out, but I, we've preached on these before. But I want to again remind you of what we believe and, and the, the foundation of which one we want to approach these three verses. Romans 9 and 11. For the children not yet born, neither having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand not of works but of him that calleth. Election. God made an election before the foundation of the world. He took your name and wrote it in the Lamb's Book of Life. I don't know who's in that Book of Life, but I know that we're given signs, and I know that if you weren't here this morning, I've got a pretty, because you're here this morning, I've got a pretty good idea your name's in the Lamb Book of Life. Now, I don't know who, and I can't say that, but the Lord does give us ways to, uh, signs that we know, and you wouldn't be here this morning, you wouldn't come to here if the Lord hadn't put something on your heart to have you here this morning. So your name, I'm going to say, your name, I feel confident, as the Apostle Paul says, I have this blessed assurance that you're a child of God and you're one of the elect. But there clearly is an election, and it's mentioned several times. I pulled that one verse out so that we could uh, point it, and, and there's a sermon in each one of these, but I just want to go back and remind us. There's an election. God made election before the foundation of the world, and he chose it in you and wrote your names in the last book of life. Not a name will be added, not a name will be taken out until the end of time when we're told in the early part of Revelation that Christ will open that last book of life and the names will be revealed. And nobody sees it, it's sealed, no names are added, no names are taken out. So nothing changes from before the foundation of, of the world until the end of the world on who's going to heaven. We go over here to Romans uh, chapter 8, just the second verse. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. Well, getting, getting salvation by doing good works is the law. That's, how, that's under the law. That's how you, you get your eternal salvation is by doing good works under the law. None of us meet up to the law. Our forefathers couldn't do it. We can't do it. You know, I'm liable to have a bad thought, commit a sin some way before I get out of the building today. So I, I'm going to fall under the law, and we all are. None of us can 
uh, have eternal salvation if we're depending on our good works or the law. But it says, but the, for the law of the Spirit in Christ, life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. Because of Christ, we're not under that old law as to our eternal salvation. Jump over here to the next chapter, Romans chapter 8, 28. Again, you know these, but let's remind ourselves. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God. You wouldn't be here this morning if you didn't have something in your heart that tells you about God and that you love God and know Him. <clears throat> that love God to them who are the called according to His purpose. God called people, elected them before the foundation of the world. That's who this is talking about. This is talking about those people that are called. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he called, excuse me, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. Whom he called, he also justified. Whom he justified, them he also glorified. There's not a person lost. The person that's mentioned in the first ones, who he foreknew, or mentioned in the last ones, are glorified. If he foreknew you, put your name, elected you for the foundation of the world, you will be glorified. There's no loss to anybody in the word men. You can't fall from grace. That's what I want to say. Once you're in that book, you're not going to get out of that book. Uh, what shall we say then to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? But verse 33, who shall then, who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifies. Who's going to charge God's elect with anything else? Who's going to charge you with any more crimes, any more sins, if God's made you free? If you're one of his elect, you're set aside. You're not charged with sins anymore. So, you know, it's not a matter of you persevering in this world. We'll talk about this in a minute. It's good to persevere. It's good to keep his commandment. It's good to abide in him. But here, according to all these other apostles, Paul is saying, not, that's not, you can't charge anything uh, to God's elect. Uh, in terms of their salvation. Verse 35, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or the sword? Is your own sins, can, can you separate yourself from the love of God? No, you cannot. Uh, 39, I feel like 38, For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come nor height nor depth nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of our God which is in Jesus Christ our Lord. If Jesus loves you, God loves you, Jesus loves you, nothing can separate you, not even yourself. You can't separate yourself from the love of God. So nothing you do or don't do can separate yourself from the love of God if you're in, uh, if you're in the Lamb's Book of Life, which again, I, I say I have reason to believe that you're all in there. Go to Second Peter, one more here. Second Peter, first chapter. Right off the bat, Simon Peter says, who's he writing to? I'm writing to them that have obtained, you've already obtained, like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior Jesus Christ. I'm writing this, you know, he's writing this to people who are already saved, who already have the faith that they got not from themselves, not from doing their work, not from abiding in Christ or following Christ, not from anything like that. You got it from Christ. You got it free from Christ. Uh, through the righteousness of God and our Savior, not your own righteousness. And he goes through and he talks about those things, and I'll skip them. And he gets over here in verse 5, it says, Now that faith that you were given by God in Christ, giving all due diligence, it should add to your faith. And you, here's, he gives you the virtues, the, the good fruits that you're supposed to add. Virtue and knowledge and no, temperance and patience and godliness and brotherly kindness and charity. He gives you all these things that you should be doing. And then he says... For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that you shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. If these things be in you, if you're abiding in Christ, if you're following the commandments of Christ and doing what he tells you to do, then you're going to produce good fruit. That's what it says over there even in the 15th chapter of John. You're going to produce good fruit if you're abiding and following Christ. But he says, verse 9, But he that lacketh these things, is blind and cannot see afar off and has forgotten he was purged from his old sins. He had, has forgotten that, that he, these things and he hasn't done these things. Then he is blind and cannot see afar off. Now remember, who was Peter writing to? He's writing to everyone that's already obtained faith. But how do you get faith? You get it from the Lord in Christ. If you've got faith, then you're a child of God. 
you've gotten that and, and, and the Lord has put himself in your heart and you've got faith and you are a child of God and that's who Peter's writing to you. Now Peter says, now there's two groups of you out there. Some of you are going to do what the Lord tells you to do. You're going to abide in him. You're going to do his word. You're going to follow him and when you do, you're going to produce a lot of good fruit. That's what we're talking about over there in John 15, that good fruit that you'll produce. You will do that. He says, but there's some of you that won't. And those of you that won't are blind and can't see far off. You know, we all know people who, who are members of the church or are good believers, but then they get away. They fall out of favor of the church or they fall out of favor. They do something else and they become blind. And they can't see far off and they forget that they were purged of their old sins. They're still purged of their sins. They've forgotten about it. That's the two different people. They're sad and everything, and they don't get to enjoy the blessings of you do when you remember your sins are purged. And you're following and abiding in him. You're bearing good fruit. There's a difference between this and this. this is you're both, both of you are sets of the elect. We're not talking about dead A and sinners here. Go back and read the first paragraph. Who's Peter writing to? He's writing to those who already have faith. And you're now you're supposed to take that faith given to you by God in Christ because of their righteousness, not because of yours. And you put it to work. And you put it to work and you learn, you get knowledge. You read your Bible, you study, you become more and more knowledgeable. When you do, you're going to be fruitful. You're going to be happy in this world, in this life. And he says, now, there's some people who don't do this, and they're going to be miserable. They're going to be blind. They can't see because they have forgotten that their old sins were purged. They're still purged. They just don't know about it. They've lost the blessings of, of knowledge that you have. By coming to church and studying your body, and you get this knowledge that we're supposed to add to, and it makes us where you will bear fruit because <coughs> you're blessed in that way. Therefore, the rather, he says, brethren, give diligence to make sure your calling and election are sure for whatever. For if you do these things, you shall never fail. Now, that's the basics. Now, let's go back to John 15. Let's read through this again now. Let's talk about it. Again, this is John 15 is the chapter that is most used to talk about falling from grace. If you're not abiding in Christ, and you see TV sermons preached on this all the time, you've got to abide in him, which means you've got to follow him. You've got to do good works. You've got to do good deeds. All these things you've got to do. If you're not doing that, and I, I, I'm not trying to discourage you from doing good deeds. I want you to do that. But you can't fall from grace. And that's what's taught by this deal. Let's, go to, let's talk about what it is talking about here. First of all, verse 1, I am the true vine. There's lots of false vines out there. There's lots of false prophets. Jesus says, I'm genuine. I'm the true vine. I'm the one you need to put your faith in. I'm the one that's going to produce the juice that's going to allow you to make have fruit. You're not going to have any fruit without me. You're not going to produce good fruit without me. I'm that vine. He says, and my father is the husbandman. My father is the one that started this. He's the one that wrote your name in the Lamb's Book of Life. He's the one that made you a branch onto the vine. He made me the vine. <clears throat> you know, in, in the, throughout the Old Testament and New Testament, Israel was many times referred to as the vine, the vineyard. The vine, it's a lot of, a lot of comparisons here to wine and vineyard. That's what got my mind started on this when I was looking at the vineyards there in Italy. <clears throat> Jesus, when he, Jesus came, he took the place of Israel. They were the chosen people, and you had to learn about the Lord through them. Jesus comes and took that place. He replaced the Jewish nation. And he says, now my people are Gentiles and Jews. It's, 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 it's God's elect. Now, we know there's a lot of the elect of, of in the, inside the Jews, but they've, they've lost their vision. They're blinded. And he points that out uh, in here, too, in a minute. But he talks about they've been blinded for a while. Now, they'll, they will come back to it at the end of time. Back to my subject. I'm the true vine and my father is the husband. Number one, I'm the genuine. I'm not a false prophet. I'm not fake. I'm the real thing. I'm the where, I'm the, where, the one that, that you'll get the juices from that will allow you to produce good fruit. All the power comes. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit be taken away, and every branch that beareth fruit he purges it that it may produce more fruit. Purges in that case, the case means prune it. He purged away the old trash out of it and pruned it up so it produced more fruit. I watched that in that those vineyards in Israel. Israel, I'm sorry, Italy. 
those vineyards in Italy, how they had taken those vines, and the vines are up on the wire now, and the grapes are on the very bottom hanging. They've got the grape hanging where they're there, and they can trim away all the dead wood, that we might call it, all the old dead leaves, and then they produce, got the wines where they hang at the bottom and they're easier to gather. They do a beautiful job with their vineyards of pruning them back, and it makes, when they get rid of all that dead stuff that sucks off the um, juice but, but doesn't produce any fruits, then it lets it all go to the good stuff. That's what we're talking about here. There may be some, what we might say, dead wood uh, among the elect, and Christ is going to prune them back, and give, that gives them gives more for you to have to produce the good fruit. He's doing it just like uh, he's talking about on uh, the grapes. He says, now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken of you. He's talking about spiritually clean. You're spiritually clean. You know, he said, the word I've spoken to you, remember this is all one meeting from, he's, he's, he's on his way probably between the upper room and the Mount Olives here, but he's just finished the Last Supper and the meal he had and he washed his disciples' feet. And the uh, disciples' feet, when he washed them, chapter 13, verse 10, Jesus said unto him, he that is washed needeth not save to wash his feet, but is clean every whit, and you are clean, but not all. Now, there's not all. He was talking about Judas. But the rest of you are clean righteously. And they weren't. They were going to sin. I'm going to tell you that you're clean righteously, too. Because you belong to Christ. You're one of his. You are spiritually clean. He has died for you. He has redeemed himself for you. You are clean spiritually. Now, if you're clean spiritually, is Christ going to cut you loose? And that's who he's talking about here. Everybody that's, that's on the vine, that's tied to the vine, you're one of the elect if you're one of the branches. And some of those branches are going to be trimmed, up, trimmed back during this time. This is what we refer to not as losing your salvation, but conditional time salvation. It's conditioned upon you doing good works and coming to church and reading your Bible and performing good deeds in the community and studying and praying. Uh, all those good things that we're supposed to do, if you do them, and he's going to reward you. He's going to reward you where you can produce fruit. Now, you don't lose, as we saw in Peter, you don't lose your salvation because you fail to do as many works. If I don't do as many works as Brother Jesse or Brother Dwayne, that doesn't mean I lose my salvation, but I'm not going to enjoy the blessings today and tomorrow that these two may be enjoying. The more good works you do, the more you abide in him, the Lord is a rewarder of those that diligently seek after him. He's going to provide you reward today and tomorrow. You know, maybe if I'm not getting the things that I w would like out of this world, maybe I'm not praying right. Maybe I'm not praying hard enough or diligently enough. Maybe I'm not praying in the right tone or voice. Lord, Lord give me a million dollars so that I can pay all my bills. I should be saying, Lord, if it's your will, help me with my finances. And then let him do it the way he would do it, not the way I would do it. I told you, you know, if I get mad at Brother Keith over here, I'm going to tell the Lord, Lord, you got to fix Brother Keith. He's got a real problem. Let me tell you how you need to do it. Here's what you need to do. You know, if, if I could fix the problem, it would already been fixed. I can't fix it. I need to say, Lord, Brother Keith and I are having some trouble. Let me go talk to him and, and bless me to approach him in the right manner, in a good mood. And let us work together and let's resolve this. If it's your will, help us to resolve our problems here. Help us to resolve our problem in the church. Help us to, help us to resolve the problems with my family, with my children. I may have a, a child or a parent or something that's got some addiction in the world, whether it's gambling or prostitution or drugs or sex or alcohol or something. All these problems we have in the world, I can't solve them. I can't, you can't solve someone who's addicted to alcohol. He's an alcoholic. You can't do it, but the Lord can. And the Lord can put it on their heart. And you can pray for that. And that's abiding in him. When you put your trust in him, he's the vine. He's where you get all your power, all your blessings. You should count your blessings. Every one of them come from him. The mistake we make is when we think that something that we do is on our own. Let me read a little further on this. He said, he said, you're clean. You are clean spiritually and righteously. He says, as I've already spoken unto you, through the whole doctrine, but especially just right earlier in the evening uh, when they're washed, he told them they were all spiritually clean. Verse 4, abide in me and I in you. 
as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself. This is the doctrine of depravity. You have no ability to do good works. None. You cannot produce any fruit at all without him. That's something that's hard for us to understand. About Well, you know, I don't really need to go to church. I don't need to pray because I'm doing pretty good. Everything's going good for me. I don't, I don't need to go to church. One, I'm doing fine. Everything you're doing good at, if you're doing good at work, in school, in your family, whatever, it's because you're bearing fruit that came directly from the vine, and that's Christ, the Lord. You can't produce a thing without the Lord blessing you. That's what he's telling us here. You get nothing. It is, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine. The branch has got to be tied to the vine to produce good fruit. We've got to be tied to Christ to produce good fruit. And we need to recognize that. Now, I thank the Lord because he blesses me so many times when I don't deserve it. He still blesses me. You know, if I approach in the right frame of mind, I don't know how to pray. I don't think I even know how to preach. I don't know how to pray. But when the Lord's with me, and when I approach it in the right manner, when I say, Lord, help me. You know, I've made this joke before about when you pray, our prayers, the length of our prayers are directly in, you know, in reverse of what we actually, our need is. You know, if everything's going good for me, I'm going to say, Lord, can you help me sell my house for $10,000 more than I've got it on the market? Can you let me go out and get me a new Cadillac instead of this old Ford that I'm having to drive, you know? Can you get me a little higher interest rate on my CD? I've got long prayers of all the things that I want that I need the Lord to help me with. But, you know, 14 years ago when I had surgery, major surgery on my heart, and I left the family, I had me on one of these stupid gurneys with those gowns that don't cover all of you up, and I'm cold natured, and I was freezing to death, and I was, after I left my family, and they all said bye, and they all started looking, well, let's check a watch, see how long he's in surgery. I laid in that hallway on that gurney in that stupid little gown for an hour before I went into the surgery room. I was by myself, and I was talking to the Lord, and I, all I said was, Lord, help me. You know, <coughs> Lord already knows what you need. It's the manner in which we approach it. And that's what abiding in him. Abiding means trusting him, believing him, not going for what you want, but asking the Lord to give me everything I need. Give me what I need. Help me out in this world. He's already taken care of you eternally. You're in this world in time right now, and that's what this is talking about. Abiding in Christ means helping you today and tomorrow by following his lead. Well, you know, I don't need to do that because I've got, I've got Dallas Cowboy football I want to go watch. You know, I want to go, you know, here and there. I want to go do everything in this world that has me offer, you know. But to put him first, and if we'll put him first, he'll let you enjoy the world. And he knows we want to be here. He gives us a reward for living long. He knows we... We want to enjoy life. He says, you know, the Ten Commandments, you know, one of them, honor your mother and father that your days on the earth may be long. By doing those good works, he's going to honor you and let you enjoy life here. This is the only life we know. We don't understand how good heaven's going to be to us, but he puts us here for a reason and we can enjoy it. You know, we need to be good good parents and good spouses and, and, and we need to do good works for our friends and our family. We do that when we abide in Christ. He said, Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine. No more can ye, except you abide in me. You cannot produce fruit unless we abide in Christ. I am the vine, you are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. Again, that's the doctrine of depravity. You have no ability to do anything good except that you abide in Christ, except you're hooked to that vine called Christ because you're one of the elect and you're a child of God. Your eternal salvation is there. You know, I, hopefully I've got a few more live, years to live, and I want to enjoy this world. I want to enjoy my family and my friends. You're going to get to do that if you abide in him, if you do the things, follow his law, his commandments. Uh, <coughs> And part of that, a big part of that is us understanding that we, we can't do anything. We can't have any blessings. We can't produce any fruit without him. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered. And men gather them and they cast them into the fire and they are burned. Now, 
Remember over there in the, uh, that's the part where they really harp on, you're going to be torn apart and cast in the fire and burned if you don't abide in him. Remember over there in Sermon on the Mount, you get to the end of that Sermon on the Mount, and Jesus says, now, you know, summing it up, he said, there's lots of false prophets, don't follow them, whatever, and he gets in, he says, now, you've heard this sermon I've preached, I'm putting this in my words, if you'll hear me and do what I tell you, then you're like the man that builds his house on a rock, on a solid foundation. And when the winds come and the storms blow, which they're going to go into, everybody has troubles in this world, and that's what he's talking about. When the storms come along, if you've done what I instructed you, if you've abided in me, then you're going to survive the storm. Your house is going to stand. He says, now, if you haven't, and again, he's talking to children of God in both cases, but if you've heard me, but you haven't done that, then you're like the man who builds his house on sand, and when the winds come, it destroys the house. It doesn't destroy the man, but it destroys the house. That's what this is talking about here. That's what Peter was talking about when he says, there are some of you who are going to add to your faith by doing good works, and there's some of you that are not. Those that, that do it, you're going to bear a lot of fruit. Those that don't, you're going to be blind and can't see far off, and you're going to forget that your sins were purged, and they're still purged. We're talking about this life today. And you notice this, it says, if a man abide in me. If. That's conditional. If you abide in me, you're going to bear fruit. That's what we're talking about with conditional salvation. Verse 7, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will, and it shall be done unto you. This is not a free pass that you're going to get an unsigned check. But if you'll ask the Lord, Lord, help me with my life. Help me be you know, uh, better to my family. Help me be better at work with my friends. Help me take care of the people I'm supposed to take care of. The Lord's going to help you with that. Verse 8, Herein is my Father glorified that ye bear much fruit, so shall ye be my disciples. We're to do this for the glory of the Lord, and that's what we ought to pray for. Lord, help me do this in a manner that glorifies you. goes back to the Sermon on the Mount, you know. If I want to go out here, if I want to glorify myself, if I had a million dollars that I could give to a college or a university or a charity, they're going to put my name on the wall, maybe name a building after me. I'm going to get glorified in that. But what if it comes Christmas time, if, if you take instead, take a big sack of groceries and some money and go leave it on somebody's porch who desperately needs it, and you sneak away real quick, ring the doorbell and run, and they open it up and they don't know who it's from, what do they say? Thank God. They could say, thank Don Richards if I left a name on it and a note and, and handed it to them. They'd thank me. I'd be getting glory. <coughs> That's what he said. You do it so the Lord is glorified, and that's abiding in him. When we do it and glorify him, as, as Jesus tells us in the Sermon on the Mount, he'll take care of you at a later. He'll take care of you of his own and, and, and multiply your blessings. If you keep my commandments, you shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things have I spoken unto you that my joy might remain in you and that your joy might be full. You might be full. You know, the, the ten lepers over there in Matthew, when they are healed, and they, they leave and go, and they're rejoicing. One comes back and says, thank you, Lord. He says, your salvation is complete. It's full. That's what he's saying. I want your joy to be full. The more you abide in him, the more you're going to enjoy this life. And the more you're going to enjoy things. The more your family is going to look up to you, and you're going to enjoy your family. You're going to enjoy work. Things are going to work better for you when you abide in Christ. Let me read now the last few verses and we'll wrap this up. This is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. Verse 13, Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends. Keep in mind, what a friend we have in Jesus. That's what he's talking about here. Uh, if you do whatever I command you. And then I want to get to verse 16 where he says, Ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you. You know, now if we're to abide in him, that sounds like I'm choosing him. No, I'm not. I'm doing what he's commanded me to do because he's already chosen me. My eternal salvation is dependent upon him, and he's already done it. He's taken care of it. I don't have any ability to have any blessing. I don't have any ability to do any good works. He said here, he says, you have not chosen me. You know, people read this and they think, well, you know, you've got to do something here for your eternal salvation. That's exactly opposite of what he's telling us here. You can't do anything without him until he gives it to you. And, you know, again, I went for Romans. He's, 
foreknown you, predestinated you, called you, justified you, and glorified you. All of those things he's done. He says, but let me finish this. You have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained that ye should go and bring forth fruit. Now, people will read this back up here and say, you must do this up here. You shall do it. Here in verse 16, he says, I have chosen you and ordained that you should do good fruit. Why didn't it say you shall? You must. You should do good fruit. Your eternal salvation is not contingent upon you doing good works. But your conditional salvation in this world today and tomorrow, you know, when I send my children, I said this, you know, out in, out in the world, when I, my son's over in Italy and I have no control over this, I pray, Lord, save him from the problem. I'm praying for his salvation, but it's timely salvation. And that's what the Lord's talking about here. You should do these things, and it will save you from a lot of the problems and cares of this world. Again, remember, you're going to, in this world, you're going to encounter problems and troubles, but he has overcome the world. He said, in ordained that you should go do, you should go and bring forth fruit, that your fruit should remain, and that whatsoever you shall ask of the Father in my name, He may give it to you. These things I command to you that you love one another. He's talking about asking the Father of things, praying to the Father to get what I need today. I need help today. You know, when I think about, you know, and I'll tell you, I'll tell each one of you, you don't need any help for your eternal salvation. That's done. That's already locked in place. What we all need help with is today and tomorrow. How do I pay bills today and tomorrow? How do I take care of my kids? How do I handle my parents? You know, uh, I've been talking to a lot of people lately who's uh, taking care of parents who get dementia, and that's what they're worried about. How do we take care of them? How do we handle them? Well, you can't, but the Lord can. But you've got to ask him. You need to ask him. We need to ask him and take care of him, and you need to understand how it works. About sometimes, and this is a lesson I learned with Brother George, sometimes we need to let people die so they can go to heaven. Instead of keeping them alive forever, hooked up to a machine, we should let them die, go and die naturally. That's what it is, abiding in Christ, understanding Christ, that he's going to take care of them better than we can, than we can even try to. You know, the Lord has richly blessed us here. We serve a wonderful Lord that's taking care of us. Now, we've got too many people to try to complicate this. So I'm going to conclude this with another verse that you know of, Ephesians 2 and 8 through 10. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. Eternal salvation here. You don't save yourself by your own works. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. If I saved myself, I'd brag about it. You know what? I got myself born again. Go read John 2. You don't get yourself born again. The Lord does it. You know, I don't even, until I know, until I become born again, I don't even know that I need to accept Christ. I don't even know my, understand my need for Christ. <clears throat> so I'd be bragging about it. Yeah. You know, I got myself baptized. I'm going to go to heaven. You need to get, how come you haven't gotten your baptized? I, you know, I'm bragging on myself. I'm, I'm taking credit for something that the Lord puts in me. He said, but not of works, lest any man should boast. And here's what I wanted, verse 10. For we are his workmanship. He created us, created in Christ Jesus unto good works. And that's what abiding is, doing good works in him. And two good works which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Abiding in Christ is something you should do. Is your eternal salvation contingent on it? No. Go read the 13th chapter of John where he's supposed to wash feet. We're to wash each other's feet. And he says, you know, if I, your Lord and Master, have done this to you, you also ought to do it to one another. And happy you are if you do. We ought to wash feet. We're the only ones that do that. I mean, a few others, but nobody else does that. But we're told we ought to do that because it makes us happy, and he's told us we should do that because we're abiding in him when we do that. That's what good works are. Good works are stuff that we should do. Not that we're going to lose our eternal salvation if we don't do them. I hope that this has helped in some manner, help clarify especially this one that's questionable. It was on my mind this week because of my time in Italy and actually looking at grapevines and it helps sometimes when Christ gives us these great physical examples to go out and look at it and study it and you go, oh, I see what he's talking about. It's like city on a hill. I went, God, every city around here is on a hill. You can't hide them. You're a city on a hill. you got a light in you. Don't take your light and hide it. Let it shine and let it shine in a manner that glory, God gets all the glory for that. I appreciate your kind attention. My prayer is the Lord richly bless each of you.